All right, so today we're going to pick up where we left off the other day, talking about, we're talking about language. Today we're going to talk about symbolism. And the reason why these two are related is because, of course, written language is symbols. And we read some of those symbols the way we read other types of symbols. So let's talk about symbols. So when we start to talk about symbols, a symbol is a vehicle for conveying meaning. There is, so we have two pieces. We have the signifier, which is the symbol. It's the signifier because it does the signifying. Then we have the signified, which is what the sim symbol represents. Now, there is no specific inherent connection between the symbol and its meaning. There may be, there normally are cultural references or things like that, but it doesn't necessarily, for example, uh, 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 an eight-sided uh, piece of metal painted red is, has nothing to do with the word stop other than we've used that symbol to tell people to stop, right? It's completely arbitrary. There's no connection between the concept of stopping your vehicle or stopping walking or stopping your bicycle or whatever it is and a red uh, uh, octagonal symbol. But yet yeah, you see that Anywhere in the world, you're going to know you've got to stop. So there is, is, the connection depends on its cultural and social understanding. We agree that the symbols mean something, which may get interesting when other people from other places come around. When we study symbols, we might be able to study it by looking at the meanings of words, because words can be symbols. Not just that they have a meaning, but they can also be symbolic. Actions can be symbolic. A ritual is a symbol. Right? So we're not just talking logos and, and emojis here. We're talking all kinds of stuff that is symbolic. We'll talk about those details. It could be the meaning of objects. If something has a sacred uh, meaning, for example, the cross, or the flag, or the Star of David, right? It is a symbol that is culturally very, very important, and it has a specific meaning to that culture. Likewise, we can approach symbols from two different ways. We can approach symbols by studying a symbol and all the ways that it's used in multiple cultures. The swastika would be a perfect example of that. You know, we automatically think, oh, Nazis. But Zoroastrians use the, the, uh, the swastika. The parts of India, the swastika has meaning. Uh, Jainism uses a version of the swastika as their, their primary holy symbol, their, their key symbol. Uh, Native Americans use the swastika. Uh, they're all different. So you can study a symbol by looking at the symbol and all the ways that it is used through across culturally. Or you can look at the signified right, what's being signified, and look at all of the different symbols that signify that across cultures. Both of which will tell you an awful lot about all the different cultures you're looking at, right? So you can approach symbols from either way. Now, some of you are going to go, well, what the hell is this going to do with me for my, my moving forward, right? Well, if you're in a lab, aren't there symbols that tell you you shouldn't drink shit, right? Symbols are everywhere. They're, I mean, they're on the walls here. Those are symbols that are made out of characters, but those characters themselves are symbols, and the, the abbreviation becomes a symbol. And it has meaning, right? And so, we take a lot of this stuff just for granted. The fire uh, alarm, it looks essentially like every other fire alarm. It, it could just be a switch. But how would you know which switch, right? The, the switch itself is a symbol. This is the fire alarm. Don't do what I did when I was nine years old and pull the fucking switch. In a brand new school that luckily they hadn't hooked the sprinklers to the day before it was going to be dedicated and hundreds of people were going to show up and I pulled the damn alarm. Oh well, that was special. So let's look at some of the different types of symbols that we as human beings use. One of the simplest is color, right? What does red mean? Could mean stop. What else? Anger. Could be anger. Could be lust. Could be blood. Could be what else? 
So what color is the primary color used in the logos for Burger King, McDonald's, uh, Jack in the Box, every Chinese restaurant you've ever been in? It's red. Because psychologically, irregardless of culture, the color red triggers appetite. You see blood, whether you're a vegetarian or not, it will trigger appetite. And so that's why the restaurants use red a lot, right? And yeah, I just gave you a whole bunch of stuff. So every time I say, well, what does this signify? You're going to read me one of those. Some of those are okay. Try to come up with something different if you can. Uh, what's the next color? Green. I mean, go is the, the, the most obvious one. We'll get that one out of the way. What are, what are some of the other things that green can symbolize? Envy. I'm sorry, what? Envy. Envy, perfect. That's a real good one. What's another one? Money, Money right? Green backs. What about the Green New Deal? What's that talking about? Yeah, it's talking about environment. So if something is green, it means that it's healthy for the environment. That has a whole you know, paragraph that that, that symbol uh, would represent. Uh, one of the students yesterday uh, said, well, um, uh, evil for green. I'm like, evil for green? And he goes, Disney uses evil for green all the time. And I went, and I'm thinking, and I'm thinking. And what he was referring to was that a lot of times something will have like, a little smoke come off of it, or a little, and it's green. I said, no, no, that's just for stench. I mean, that's just, it stinks bad, right? I mean, think about it, the fact that vegetables are green, and we're good for that, but any other food that's green, we get freaked out, right? And has it ever dawned on you there are no, or very few, true blue foods? Give me a name of a blue food. Purple. Give me a name of a blue food. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Yeah, there are two. Hmm? Nope, they're purple. Um, there is a strain of corn that is truly blue. It is blue. That's how you get blue tortilla chips. It's not food coloring. It is blue corn. And there's a strain of potatoes. Now, there's also a purple strain, but there's a strain of potatoes that is high in iron, and the starches cause it to turn blue. In fact, if you cook uh, a regular potato in a cast iron skillet that hasn't been seasoned, just the raw iron, It'll turn your potatoes blue. Blue, not purple. Those are the only two blue foods. So blue is not an appetizing color, right? Think of it. Put food coloring in your ice cream. Make it blue. Well, you might get by with that. Put it in your mashed potatoes and try to eat it. Put blue food coloring in your mashed potatoes and go, I think I'll put some gravy on that, right? I mean, people right now are you know, shaking their heads and going, I, I wouldn't be able to do it. You know it doesn't taste any different, right? But, so color is a very important signifier. Right? It, can, it can trigger really animal uh, uh, responses in you as a person. Revulsion, hunger, right? stench. White, what do we usually, what's, what's usually white? I'm sorry, what? Purity. Yeah, purity, right? The what? It's a base color, right? It's actually the absence of all color. Black is the absence of all light, white is the absence of all color or all colors combined, depending on whether you're doing light or whatever. Um, but a lot of things can be white. Black, of course, is usually whatever the opposite of, of, of white is in yellow. Yellow could be pause, slow down, could be all kinds of stuff, cloud like that. So, another po powerful symbols are animals, right? Eagle, what's it stand for? Freedom, liberty, right? Strength, ah, I don't know about strength so much. I, the lion might be strength. A bull might be strength, right? Um, a dog. Loyal. Loyal, always the first one. What if it was a wolf? Danger. It'd be danger. What if it is a uh, coyote? Scavenger. <laughs> Could be a scavenger. Could also be the trickster. Most Native American uh, religions, the coyote is the one that plays tricks on everybody else. About a cat. What do you know about cats? Sneaky. They're what? <laughs> They're what? Sneaky. Sneaky. Yeah, I was going to say independent, but sneaky works, right? That, that works, right? They're aloof. They're independent. They're curious. They're curious. They're very curious. In fact, the, re the way we domesticated cats was we keep them kittens. Feral cats are actually adults. That's why they want nothing to do with you. 
but when you keep a cat at home, you actually keep, that's why they, they can be 14 years old and they're still trying to get you to produce milk, right? Because we keep them kittens. We, we actually stunt their emotional growth. I actually really like cats. My, my favorite cat of all time just died and I'm heartbroken. Uh, um, but this is a very different kind of cat. Do you have the same reaction? No, oh, the lion, power, right? It's, the, you know, it's one of the symbols of, of the UK, the lion. Where there are there lions in Britain? Right? And those aren't even lions on the shirt. Those are, are uh, leopards. Because um, Richard the Lionhearted didn't have lions on his chest. He had leopards. Um, owl. What's an owl signify? In the, in the West, what's it signify in the, near, in, the, in the Middle East? It's a bad omen. It's the worst symbol you can get, right? Same symbol, different meaning. Look across cross-culturally. It's one of the ways to, to, to look at it. So animals can be symbols. And if animals are taken one step further, they become totems. And totems are where, I mean, what's our totem here? Bulldog. Yeah, the bulldog. That's our totem animal, right? We want to take on the qualities of the, of the fucking bulldog, right? <laughs> it is, right? When I was up at UC Merced, they're the cougars, which is a sweet, cute little cat. And somebody said, oh, they're all the UCs are cats. No, they're not. Um, uh, it was, it's a bobcat, right? Not a cougar, it's a bobcat. We have bobcats that come on campus on a regular basis, so it's, it's part of our, our stuff. But when they were first putting the school together, there are uh, vernal pools up there that have an endangered species that we had to move the campus from where we were going to build it to where it currently is because of the, these little critters. And so one of the proposals was to name the mascot of the school after those critters. So it would have been the fighting fairy shrimp. <laughs> Just wait till they go up against the banana slugs. <laughs> and people wonder why the UCs are a little, <laughs> a little crazy, right? Um, so a totem is, is really, a ta it, it is the animal um, representation of a group. It, it has the attributes that that group seeks. And if it doesn't actually have them, they'll superimpose them, right? You know, like somehow Spike the Bulldog, or, or, or it's, it's Victor E now, it used to be Spike, but uh, the, the Bulldog um, somehow is studious and um, gets all of his work done on time. Right? I mean, if you, ask, if you ask the dean, that's what she'll tell you. Um, this, of course, is, a, is what we normally think of as a totem. This is from the Pacific Northwest, where my great-grandfather used to work. Uh, but all of these are totems. One next to, of course, is an Aztec totem. And here you see his totem animals are, are, are here. Right? He belongs to this particular military order. Uh, both the Aztec and Mayan and almost all of the Mesoamerican cultures, their military orders were divided up among different totems. And so there'd be one for the jaguar, there'd be one for the, the, the parrot, there'd be one for the eagle, there'd be one for the fox or the coyote. Um, all different, different ones, but they would be based on animals and, and they would take on the attributes. These are Roman, uh, Roman legions used to do these. Each legion would have, you, would, you could tell the history of a legion by the totem that they had. And so you see all different types of, you know, there's buildings and there's uh, body parts and there's all kinds of stuff on there. And if you knew what that shit meant, you'd be able to know where that, that, that unit had, that, cent that century had been uh, uh, assigned. Uh, this is an African uh, totem. Um, just the one animal on this particular one, it's carried on a, on a staff. But all of these, you know the relations. Like, the reason that there are multiple faces on these is because this is the primary one for this particular group. But these totems, which are other groups, are also related to them. And so that it's a position to show the unification and the, and the, and the, the links between people. Our numbers have meanings, right? What's the luckiest number? Well, it didn't used to be. Well, used to, it used to be in the West, the luckiest number was 13. What the fuck? What happened? Well, it was the luckiest number during the period of the Iron Age, well, and probably before that, and the whole time the Romans were running Europe, and for right up into probably about 500, 600 A.D. But when Christianity came in, they said, oh, that's pagan, therefore it's from the devil, therefore it's unlucky, and black cats ceased to be the lucky cats, and the thir number 13 ceased to be lucky just because it was the opposite of what the Christians wanted people to do. So it, it, it got that. 
But all of these numbers, depending on your culture, have some, all, all, um, you know, basically all the basic numbers do. Larger numbers can as well. You know, one can be you know, sign of unity. It can be all kinds of stuff. Four can be bad luck. Seven can be good luck. Nine can be the number of perfection because it's the largest decimal number you can create without adding another uh, place. You'd have to add the tens place in order to make it a bigger number. So it's a, in the Middle East, it's considered a number of perfection. Thirteen, of course, used to be a lucky number. Um, even the landscape can be symbolic. Um, for example, flowers, right? Here's a, here, a lotus. That would be important for Buddhists. It would be important for Hindus. It could be an important symbol. Rivers, all of the earliest quote-unquote civilizations, all of the large empires, whether we're talking in India, we're talking in Egypt, we're talking in, in um, uh, the central part of the United, what's now the United States, we're talking about China, we're talking about the Middle East, every place where there were early civilizations were on the banks of a river. We call them riverine societies, right? Mesopotamia, the Tigris and Euphrates. China, the, the Yangtze and the, and, and, and the Yellow. Uh, India, the Indus and, and the Ganges. Um, Mississippi here in, on this continent. Every one of those societies grew up along the banks of that river and much of their mythology, much of their, their worldview comes from that. And so the rivers themselves are sacred. The, the Ganges today is considered a sacred river. It's full of all kinds of bacteria and shit, but people bathe in it for their health, right? Because it's sacred, it's the source of all life. The Nile was seen the same way. And so rivers can have, can be a symbol. Mountains can be a symbol. Um, if you live in a flatland, a mountain's pretty mysterious, it's pretty special. Almost every society has at one point or another um, believed that the gods were either up there or down there. And the mountains are a way to get to both. Right? There are probably caves in the mountains. And you climb up the mountain, you get closer to up there. Right? So you're either going to the sky or you're going to the underworld. If you go to Mexico City and you go to Teotihuacan, and you stand in the right place and look at the Temple of the Sun, right behind it is the mountain that it signifies. The same with the Temple of the Moon. It is right there. You can see it. They're the same basic shape. So in the Andes, of course, they're already in the mountains. Right? So they, would, would, they had other places that were sacred spaces. Now, place and space is not a synonym. A place is a location. So we're at Fresno State. That's a place. But right now, he and I happen to be in a personal space where we can be having a conversation. We are also all in a shared space, right? And we can extend that shared space once we open the doors into people that are out on, the, on the, the, the walks and stuff, right? So place is the physical location. Space is the occupied portion of that, right? And the concept of sacred space should be very common, right? If you practice any form of religion, there's a place you go to do that. Whether it's ancestor worship in your home, or whether it is um, uh, going to the, a Catholic church, or going to a synagogue, or going to temple, or whatever, there's a place that is sacred. And most societies have that as well. And oftentimes they are either shaped like mountains. Right? The Olmec built the largest pyramid ever. Bigger than anything in Egypt. Bigger than anything else in, in the rest of Mesoamerica. The earliest large-scale civilization in Mesoamerica built the largest temple ever. Largest uh, pyramid ever. So what did the Spanish do? They chopped off the top when they got there and put a church on top. Right? Because it was so important. Right? It was such a symbol of this is where your spiritual life rests that you just take and put a church on top of it. During most of the Roman Empire throughout Europe, under the pagan period prior to the Roman paganism, because that's a different form of paganism, one of the places in Europe that was always sacred were, were, were springs. We don't have a lot of springs in the United States. We have some. There are a couple up here in the mountains that I know of. But most of the places we get them out of, out of uh, streams start with because of snow melt. But in, most, in much of Europe, water just bubbles out of the ground. And it's clean, and it's clear, and it's cold, and it's beautiful. In other words, it's life coming right out of the planet. right? 
and that makes it sacred. It makes it a sacred place, and then the space that you interact with that water is the sacred space. Well, the Romans just came in and said, okay, we've got a different deity, we'll just stick it on the same blasted place, and they kept the location. You go to Mexico City today, and the cathedral is built right on the top of the, of the primary pyramid of Mexico City. It's made out of the, the, the bones of it. They just mantled it to build the cathedral. Because if the space is sacred, and I want my religion to take over, I want that space. Right? Because it, it legitimizes my existence. Like I said, flowers can be a symbol. Uh, in the 15th century, uh, England went through a period where Matilda and her brother were fighting over who's going to be king. And each of them took a rose. The red rose and the white rose. Well, when it was all done, all said and done, and the war ended, it became known as the Tudor Rose by combining the two. Why does the Tudor Rose matter? Because it's both red and white. It's the unification of Matilda and her brother. Key symbols are those symbols that need no explanation and they encompass a, a large whole in themselves. For us, it would be the Statue of Liberty, the American flag, the Pledge of Allegiance, the National Anthem. Right? You don't need any explanation. You know what it signifies. It'll get you all choked up whether you buy into it or not, right? Because it's such a big and powerful image. Great Britain, this isn't the English symbol. This is the Great Britain symbol. This is the unified of course, the Soviet Union over there. So these are just examples of symbols that signify, you know, what we refer to as key sy symbols, that signify an entire huge notion. And underneath that, there will probably be other symbols or symbolism within it. Sometimes these are compound, as are the two over here. So when we classify symbols, we classify them in a, a number of ways. And one of the ways that we signify key sy uh, uh, symbols is if they are summarizing, like a flag or a cross or a Star of David, if it is a summarizing key sig uh, symbol, then it is, it is possibly uh, sacred or something close to that, and there's no more elaboration needed. It, is, it stands on its own. An elaborating symbol is something that supports your key symbols and it may be either a scenario, right, an explanation, an action to explain what the key, sing, key, key symbol means, or it could be a root metaphor. A, a, a metaphor is something where you describe it in something, this is compared to this, is that is compared to that, right? And so you either give it a comparison to make the meaning clear, or you give an illustration to make the meaning clear. If the key symbol is sacred, it probably needs no elaboration. The society, will, everyone in the society will know what that symbol means. It's only when, it, when it's pulled back and, and there's questions. And so, on the summarizing side, basically all the religious symbols would, would work. And like I said, here, here's at least one swastika out of the middle of nowhere uh, here for Jainism. Um, it's just the way it goes. So, in the broadest sense, these symbols are emotional. They touch you beyond the intellectual. You listen to the, the blasted anthem where the woman's butchering the hell out of it, and, or the guy is butchering the hell out of it, because it's a hard song to sing. And I just want the song to be over and the puck to drop, right? But everybody gets down to that land of the brave and home of the free, and people get puffed up, and people get a little teary-eyed, and, and it happens to me too, right? What the fuck does it mean? What is land of the brave and home of the free? Define it. You can't. Right? It is, a, it is pure emotion. It is perfect propaganda. It works. Right? This is why symbols matter. Because they convey meaning. Not just like the meaning up in the periodic chart, but they can convey, especially key symbols, can, will have a major impact emotionally. Often these are used to compound or to expand on a unitary idea. Elaborating systems are a way to sort out the complexities of ideas and feelings. It makes it possible to explain it. 
right? Because not everybody's going to feel that emotion. They don't have the, they don't have the cultural reference, the cultural um, um, touchstone in order to be able to do it. So as I said, a root metaphor, it's a metaphor, a this is like this, which is like that, is a group, a, a group of, of ways to m explain and to make order out of the, the, the key symbol. So for example, if I put a flag up, you're going to know that I'm talking about the United States. But if I put up a little symbol of a factory, right, a couple of, of steam, uh, or of, of uh, uh, smokestacks and a, 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 a slanted roof and a couple of windows in it, you might not know that that's a factory. But I have a little reference down in the key, right? The key to the chart, and it says that's a factory. Well, now you know what that is. That's an elaborating symbol. It's not immediately recognizable on its own. But if I put a, if I put a machine wheel or a factory or a, 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 something like that in a chart, you're going to make the assumption it has something to do with modernity, has something to do with manufacturing, has something to do with... Th th there are ideas you can bring to it. So even without elaborating in the, in the descriptions, you can still have uh, elaborating symbols that will expand on uh, the view of what you're talking about. Uh, a couple of examples here are, the, of course, the, the wheel in Indo-Tibetan cosmology and the cows for the Dinka in Africa. The cows are everything. They're the entire economy. Um, men dye their hair red in the urine of the cattle every morning, um, fresh and warm. They, they drink the milk and they drink the blood. Oh, and they mix the milk and the blood together to make a third drink, right? So you've got a, a three-flavored cow. They very seldom butcher them and eat them because they keep producing both the blood and the, and the, and the milk and the urine. In India, cows are so sacred, you can literally buy cow pee. You can buy cow pee and cow poop soap made from those elements, right? There are entire industries using the byproducts of cattle because they can't kill them. But can you literally pull yourself up by your bootstraps? Let's say you take those hooks, you grab those straps and you pull. Are you going to get pulled? Are you going to get lifted? If you do, where are you going to end up? On your ass. That's right. I mean, you, you cannot, you lit. So here we tell people, you know, come to America and you need to lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. In other words, we're telling you it's impossible to start with, right? That's why we have an American dream. You've never heard, have you ever heard of the Italian dream? The Russian dream? The Botswana dream? No, they just live their lives. We have this carrot that we dangle. The American dream, right? Everybody wants the American dream. What is it? Then you have a definition. It's a symbol. What's it a symbol of? Whatever the fuck you want it to be, right? Because it has no real meaning, right? It's a symbol. It signifies. Even the pull yourself up by your bootstraps is a symbol because you can't do it, right? So it's just part of the, part of the way that we view the world. Root metaphors generally establish a worldview suggest certain uh, ways of acting, whereas a scenario pres prescribes um, courses of action that may or may not be literal. And they make certain assumptions of a worldview. So that you already have somewhat of the same. Now, let's talk about rituals. What are some rituals that are symbolic? What are some rituals? <laughs> uh, baptisms. Baptism? Why is that symbolic? I mean, you're getting the baby wet. I mean, you're actually doing something. Does the baby know? Probably not, right? But it's a symbol of cleansing his soul, making him pure, which he already was. He hasn't done anything, right? But you're going to do it again to make sure, right? So you sprinkle or dunk or douse or whatever your, your particular group does. It is a symbol. 
And if you know the symbolism, you get all excited. Oh, baby's first, baby's first, bab you know, baby's baptism, and, and then we got confirmation and first communion, all those things, right? Mostly it's adults that get excited about it. But they are symbols of that, pers that child's spiritual growth. Right? He's moving through this spiritual community through a proscribed, prescribed method, and he's hitting benchmarks, or she, or whatever it happens to be. Um, what are some other rituals? Fourth of July has got some rituals, like don't bur burn your yeah light shit, and don't bur don't burn your house down or blow your fingers off. On the, the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance is a huge ritual. You had to do it every fucking morning for 13 years. Do you remember the words? More than that, did you ever did you ever figure out what the words say? Did you ever think about the meaning? Or did you just get up and do it? I'll bet you most of the time you just got up and did it, right? Yeah. Oh, that would be cool. I've never, I've never tried to say it in Spanish. Yeah, well, that's the way I'm about the English version. Especially because they keep changing it, right? The original pledge was not American. It was international. It was written by a socialist. Same as, your, as God Bless America. Uh, written by a different socialist. But the original pledge was, I pledge allegiance to my flag and to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. End of pledge. There's no God in there. There's no specific country. It's not the flag. It's my flag. Right? Very different. And over the time, we've changed it because the meaning we want to convey has changed. Right? Originally, it was so that everybody could be proud of their country and, and have some patriotism in their flag. And then we took it and we made it so you know, it's just our pledge. And we had to stick God in there because even though our Constitution says that there's nothing to do with religion in our government, because the Soviet Union was a godless nation, suddenly we had to get rid of our old national uh, slogan, which was, out of many, one, and turn it into, in God we trust which is a complete and total violation of the separation of church and state, because which God? Brahman? Shiva? Isis? Which God? If you've got a specific God, then you are supporting a specific religion. But we did it. We added it to the pledge for the same reason. So we wouldn't be godless. We did take out the salute, because it, it start, used to be, I pledge allegiance to my flag, and you stood there like this the rest of the way. That kind of went away in the 30s and 40s, don't you think? <laughs> right? My mother was actually in school, and they took it out. It's not that long ago. You know, I mean, we're just, it's just you know, a couple of generations away. So, symbols can change. And even the change can be symbolic. What are some other rituals? Praying. Praying. Sometimes that can be very ritualistic or it can be very, very casual, depending on your belief system and, and yourself. Um, you know, if you're Muslim, you pray five times a day regardless. Um, and there are certain physical things. You do your ablutions, you turn east. You know, there's, there are things that you do to focus. Um, so that's obviously a ritual. Even, the, even the, saying the Lord's Prayer in, as a congregant prayer in, in a Christian church is, is pretty much the same way. Buddhist monks, a lot of times, will go through purifications Native Americans, they'll smudge, they'll do all kinds of stuff as part of the prayer. So there's always, you know, ritual is, it can always be involved with, with prayer. Even if you fold your hands or do whatever you do, um, that could be ritualistic. Right? Doesn't mean, just because something is a ritual doesn't mean that it's bad. It just means that it's a habit. And most rituals develop to explain something. Um, for example, um, the next big holiday that we will see coming up, of course, will be Ishtar. I mean, Easter. Uh, it's symbolic because it has a lot to do with chickens and bunnies. Otherwise, I don't know what it's for. Because that's all I see in the stores is chicken and fucking bunnies. Right? And a lamb once in a while. Right? Oh, yeah, the eggs, because bunnies lay eggs. <coughs> the chickens. What chickens? 
Those chickens are all babies. They shouldn't be going at it. They're smaller than the egg. And the egg's made out of chocolate. Which came first, chicken or the egg? Egg. egg reptiles. <sighs> Fish. Fish have eggs. They came before rep they came before before birds. Right? The egg came first. Anyway, um, so let's take Easter. Let's take Christmas. They have ritualistic aspects to it, right? Early Christians couldn't practice their religion in the open. So they practiced their holidays during other people's holidays. So you have during Easter, which used to be Ishtar, which was, an, uh, which was borrowed originally from the Egyptians, but became part of paganism in Europe. And it was a celebration because it is in the spring of, of renewal. And so bunnies and puppies and lambs and chicks and eggs are all about fertility and renewal. Oh yeah, there's that thing about Jesus in the cave. I don't remember all that. Yeah, but, that but, but what do we really what do? We really do? What are the rituals we do? The, we go do the egg hunt in the backyard with the kids because it's fun, right? But it has meaning. What is the meaning? I mean, in... If you're just practicing it secularly, then you're just celebrating Ishtar. Christmas, right? Why does it always fall close to Hanukkah? Because they celebrated Christmas at the same time as they did Hanukkah. According to the Bible, depending on how you read it, Jesus was either born in April or in October. Neither one of which is in the dead of fucking winter. I mean, only Christians celebrate the New Year on the coldest fucking night of the year. Everyone else, it's the first day of spring, right? <laughs> Pagan religions in Europe, it was the first day of spring. It was the day of renewal. The Middle East, no ruse, the new day, no, no ruse, the new year is the first day of spring. Japan, the spring festival, that's the beginning of the new year. Christians go, new year, let's start that one, it's really fucking cold. Right? What the heck? Because, you were the, the, because initially the calendar was lunar. All the days are the same number of months. Have you ever thought about the calendar? Right? Because it's a symbol, right? Have you ever thought about what, what does December mean? When we talked about morphemes, where you know, we take words that have meaning and you put them together to make a longer word. What's December mean? Ten. Yeah, it's the tenth month. <laughs> What's November? In Espanol, como se dice nine? All right. That's close. So what is the night what is November? It's the ninth month. What the fuck? Because it used to be a ten month calendar, and it used to be a lunar calendar. Then they decided that's not working out because every year things are at different times. So inadvertently they just said we're gonna solidify the calendar, we're gonna add two more months to it. July for the supreme Ju for the divine Julius and August for Augustus. Right, this is the Romans doing this because the original calendar was Babylonian, which makes which is really screwy because they liked base twelve. Whole another problem. Uh, they were the ones who invented this. No, the Babylonians had an eight day week. Can you imagine? Different societies had different lengths of week. You so, you so much think that a week is seven days that you couldn't imagine that being eight days. Right? I mean, if every sixth day you got two days off, right? You can't get your brain around it. Think about that. Anyway, um, so that's how, the, anyway, that's how the, 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 the Christian celebrations ended up entwined with the... the um, with the pagan and the Jewish holidays, right? Hanukkah and the winter solstice are why Christmas is where it is. Another type of, of um, ritual we refer to as rites of passage. Um, there are a couple listed up here. What are some of them? Quinceanera. Quinceanera, sweet 16 parties, um, coming out balls, debutante balls, you realize that the, what that is saying is, she's fertile, boys. She's available. 
That's the purpose. Right? Because remember, he's going to sell you off at some point. So, put her, on, put her on the market. She's fertile now. Get her out of my house. Get her into yours. I'm sick of paying for this bitch, right? <laughs> you can take over. I'll pay for the wedding, right? That's why the, wife, the, the, the woman's family, traditionally in our culture, play, pays for the wedding, right? But there's a re there are reasons, you know, there are symbol that, that's symbolic, right? Bar it, it's, it, it is what it is. It's an ancestor worship practice. It's a, it's a ritual, and it's, it's connecting the family, right? You go see Grandma, she isn't going to eat much, but you go see Grandma, and it keeps that connection alive, right? How many of you knew your grandparents? How many of you knew your great-grandparents? How many of you knew your great-great-grandparents? And there's very few of us. Hispanic family, right? The families stay close. The families, when someone dies, they don't leave the family, right? In a lot of societies, they don't even leave the building. You bury them under the kitchen floor. That way you always know where grandma is, right? And she'll help you. She'll help you find stuff if you leave it lying around. She knows she's there, right? She'll help you cook. She'll help you do whatever, right? And so... Different societies have different views of old people. We like to just shunt them away. Like you've been reading about some of this stuff with, with geriatrics, right? We love sticking them in old folks. Home. We don't have to fuck with them. You know, one of these days, he's going to do that to me. He's like, Dad, it's time for you to go. Right? And put me out to pasture. Because right? <laughs> that's just natural. Another type of ritual that is a symbol, and this goes back again to the calendar, is rites of intensification. Thanksgiving is a harvest festival. That's what it comes from, right? Celebrating New Year's on the first day of spring, Noruz or the, the Chinese Spring Festival, it's because the seasons are changing. Right? Friday night's date night, right? It it's essentially is a rite of intensification because you got to the weekend. So these are, are times when the environment changes. Places where they only have two seasons, places where they only have one season, don't have that many of these. One of the reasons we have calendars is that as different human societies evolved, they needed to know when to hold the next rite. And so they would keep track. They they'd actually, people with their jobs was to follow the stars, just to figure out where the planets were, to figure out where the stars were, to figure out how long the day was. Is the day getting longer? Is the day getting shorter? On that date when we're at that point, I mean, this is why... We, there are massive uh, numbers of, of, um, of monuments in, in Central and South America that are on uh, astronomical alignments. Almost all of the hinges in all, and I'll take it back, all of the hinges in Europe and, and Great Britain and, and all of that area, those are all aligned with the stars. They're all aligned with the solstice and the, uh, the equinox. The ancients wanted to know what, what was going on with the calendar so that they could plan for their rites of intensification, for the spring festival, for the fall harvest, for the winter, try to chase away the dark, right? The, 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 the shortest day of the year is late December, and that's why Christmas is where it is, and it's to fight that. I mean, we have New Year's on the, right, you know, a week within the coldest day of the year, the shortest day of the year. Why? That doesn't make sense.